Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, deep valleys, the beauty that surrounds me all makes me aware of the one who made it all. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Never more will I be all Promise me that we never would part. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Never more will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. For thus say the Lord, when seventy years have been completed by, for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come to pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. I bring my sins to thee, the sins I cannot count, that all may cleansed be in thy once open found. I bring them, Savior, all to thee. The burden is too great for me. The burden is too great for me. I bring my grief to thee. The grief I cannot tell. No word shall need it be, thou knowest all so well. I bring my sorrow laid on me, O suffering Savior, all to thee. O suffering Savior, all to thee. My life I bring to thee, I would not be my own. O Savior, let me be thine ever, thine alone. My heart, my life, my all I bring to thee, my Savior and my King. To thee, my Savior and my King. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. 
What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise in all creatures here below. Praise in above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well, with my soul. Probably six months as our niece Heather was getting worse with cancer and then we sang it at her memorial service a few weeks ago. But it says so much and it's so full of hope and perspective. Um... It was written by a fellow named Horatio Spafford. And Horatio lived in Chicago, was a successful lawyer, and he had bought up a few properties, was an investor in the city. And then the, the great fire of Chicago happened in 1871, and he lost most of his properties. It was a bad year. And in 73, 1873, he and his family planned on going on a trip to Europe. After two very difficult years, they wanted to get away. But the business responsibilities that he had held him back. 
And so his wife and four little daughters left first on a ship sailing to London. And Horatio was going to follow a couple of weeks later. On the way there, another ship collided with theirs. And I think 273 people drowned, including his four little daughters. Only his wife survived. When she arrived, she sent a cable to Horatio, saved alone, what shall I do? He immediately booked passage on another ship and headed out to England. Can you imagine what that trip was like? As they approached the area where his daughters had died, the captain found Horatio and said, Sir, this is the area where the collision happened. And it was there that Horatio Spafford wrote the words to, It is well with my soul. <sighs> A pretty sad way to start this sermon out, isn't it? The truth of it is, tragedy and sorrow are a natural part of the human experience. Imagine Adam and Eve's guilt and grief when Cain killed his brother Abel. You know that they had to feel some responsibility. It was their sin that caused the eviction from the Garden of Eden that unleashed the plague of sin on humanity and their sons were caught up in it. The early chapters of Genesis tell us about the global flood that killed hundreds of thousands of people. That was a terrible time, a time of suffering and loss, even for the family of Noah. I wonder if they ever felt survivor's guilt. It was the flood they were saved from and that saved them from the corruption in the world that killed their neighbors and friends. Some people have been conditioned by life's experiences to believe that when things are going too well for them, that there's a tragedy just around the corner. Maybe you've felt that way at times. And maybe you've heard that, that old idea that death comes in threes. I've heard that dozens of times. You know, there's no rational evidence to support this. Long time ago, it, it seemed that three friends or family had died in a period of a year. And so someone said, boy, it seems like death comes in threes. And then somebody else said, you know, that, that happened in our family too. It must be true. It's based on anecdotal evidence. There's no, it's just a superstition. And yet, it reflects what people think. Who are asking, what's next when something bad happens? The truth is that life is full of joyful and uplifting times and wonderful people. And occasionally tragedies happen. And occasionally we have to suffer, suffer loss. The loss doesn't dominate our lives, but it just seems to overwhelm it when it does come. And so we have to remember that most of life is full of joy and accomplishment. Some people referred to a statement in Job chapter 14 as proof that God has already determined the number of days we're going to live. You know, he knows when you're going to die. He's got that date set. There's really nothing you can do about it. And, uh, you know, you... <laughs> you're, when your number's up, your number's up. Let me show you the statement. It's Job 14, verse 5. Man's days are determined... You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. Sounds pretty plain, doesn't it? And it's in the Bible. Let me teach you something about looking at things in context, okay? Let's look at the whole statement of Job. Now, you know what's going on in Job, don't you? 
the devil challenges God. He says, you know that guy, Job? That guy, the only reason that he is blessed is because you, the only reason that he trusts you is because you're, you do all these good things for him. If you took those things away, he would curse you. And God says, I will allow you to bring some sorrow and tragedy into his life. But don't take his life. And so, you know, that transpires. It's pretty horrific what happens in Job's life. And his, fr his wife says, Job, what did you do wrong that God is judging you this way? His friends, his closest friends, you know, the buddies that he has breakfast with every week. They say, obviously, obviously, you're a sinner and you've been hiding it and God is teaching you a lesson. He's trying to straighten you out. He wants you to repent. What have you done? And Job said, I don't think I've done anything wrong. Now we read the first chapter of Job and we know that God says, Job is the best. He is the prime example of a man of righteousness who trusts me. And so he holds Job up to the universe to say, this is my best. We know in the background that that's what's happening. But his friends, it doesn't look like that to them. And so, you know, they're, I think they're well-intentioned, but they're way off base. And they're causing him more harm than good. And it's right after one of his friends, Zophar, rails on him and says, Job, you know, you, you must be a horrible person. That chapter 14 begins. And Job starts by answering Zophar. Actually, chapter 13 begins. Job starts answering Zophar. It's his monologue against Zophar. And in the midst of that monologue, he addresses God. And this is where he says to Zophar, man is born of woman. Man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and withers away like a fleeting shadow. He does not endure. Do you fix your eye on such a one? Will you bring him before your judgment? In the midst of that, he, he addresses God in a well, cynical way. He says, who can bring what is pure from the impure? No one. Man's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. Now look at how the how this section ends. He says, so look away from him and let him alone till he is put in his time like a hired man. It's just like Job is saying, you know, if this is all life is, if, if we, we, we just are here to put our time in, then God, turn away from me. Just look away from us. Have nothing to do with our lives. Just let us live and then die. So you can't just pick one of those verses out of there and say, ah, see, it says that God has determined the number of our days. This is what Job is saying that God says. It's not what God says God says. And you say, but wait a minute, Tim, it's in the Bible, so it's true. Of course it is. Do you know the Bible quotes the devil sometimes? Is that true? It's true that it quotes the Bible, but it doesn't mean that that statement is a true statement. Just go to Matthew chapter 14 when Jesus is tempted by the devil. And the devil is twisting scripture around, misusing scripture. Are we supposed to believe the devil just because his quotation's in the Bible? I think not. So read the Bible discerningly in context. Now, does God know when you're going to die? He does exactly know. Because he knows future as well as history. Nothing is outside of God's knowledge. I think of it as God is above the mountains. He sees the tops of the mountains and the valleys. He sees all the events in your history line before they even happen. 
because he can see the future. He is not contained by time or space. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that there is no benefit in eating a healthy portion of vegetables every day. In, uh, in doing other things to protect your health, getting some exercise, moving every day in order to extend your life. It doesn't mean that, you know, psh, I've got a certain number of days, what's the difference? Why should I do anything about it? I'll do risky things. Why drive with a seatbelt? You know, God knows when I'm going to die. He's got my day set. If today's my day, there's nothing I can do about it anyways. Hmm. I told you about when we went skydiving. Now there's a, <laughs> that was a dumb thing to do, wasn't it? And the, the young fellow that I was going to be strapped to, you know, that doing a tandem dive, and I said, I want to give you a mental health check before we go on this endeavor, because I want to make sure that you're not suicidal today. This would be a bad day for you to end your life, because I'll be with you. And he answered my questions properly, and I said, okay, <laughs> I'll go with you. <laughs> but if we come back next year, I'm going to check you out again, buddy. <laughs> You see, what Job is talking about is he does touch on some truth, though. There's some statements in Scripture, for example, like this one. When James says, what is your life? You know, before this, he says, you know, instead of saying, we're going to go to this or that city and do this business and that business, he said, you better say, if God wills. He says, what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now there's a perspective we ought to have that if you're 95 years old, your life has gone by as a, as a mist in light of all of eternity. You stand back and you take a, a broader perspective on things. And in Psalm 39, he says, You've made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. <laughs> and so we need to focus on something that's a little more solid than that. So, God is interested in our future. He is with us in the present. He doesn't turn his back on us. He doesn't take his eyes off from us. And he does know how and when we will die, but he knows that he created us and gave us the breath of life. He made us for life. Now, how does that fit in with what Horatio Spafford was experiencing in his deep grief? Well, he teaches us to anchor ourselves to what is most important, to what is permanent and reliable. In fact, that song, if I might quote another phrase from it, he says, Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Hmm. That is much more than saying, I'm okay. What happened was God's will. And by the way, I urge you not to tell people that when they have just suffered a loss or a tragedy. Well, it was God's will anyways. What? Well, sure, if it happened, it had to be God's will, because if it weren't his will, he would have stopped it. What? Where did you get that notion? It's not God's will that evil people harm other people. It's not God's will that disasters occur. 
the few times we see that God causes judgments to come upon people, he tells us that it's his will because he records it that way in Scripture. You better be careful about attributing things to God that he does not say are attributed to him. It's like uh, slandering God, you know, by saying, well, obviously that hurricane was God's judgment upon this little island nation that got scrubbed from the face of the earth. What? Don't say that about God. Don't blaspheme him that way. Or people who years ago said that the AIDS epidemic was God's judgment on homosexuality. What? That was irresponsible. It wasn't true. And it was dangerous. And instead of turning people to God, it put a stumbling block in front of them when they were trying to approach God. Horatio Spafford is writing this when he says, it is well, it is well with my soul. He says, you have taught me to say, speaking to God, it is well, it is well with my soul. Now this guy is writing this when he's going past the spot with his four, where his four precious little girls died in a cold November sea. He's in deep sorrow. The people who were the delight of his life are gone. His wife is all alone and 3,000 miles away. But in the midst of his distress, he is able to recall what God has taught him. And so he goes back to what he knows is true. And at the core of that is that his sins have been nailed to the cross. That God is a God of love, of not just love, but amazing and remarkable and sacrificial love. And that he has not abandoned Horatio Spafford, and he has not abandoned Horatio's wife, and he has not abandoned Horatio's daughters. You have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You know, on Wednesday nights, and I urge you to join us either in person or virtually online, we've been studying Ezra and now we're in studying Nehemiah, was, which is simply a continuation of the history timeline that begins in Ezra. And because of Judah's, the southern kingdom's sin, God has judged them and has caused them to lose their homeland and be taken as captives to the land of Babylon. But he says, even in the midst of the prophecy of judgment against them, he says, it will only be for a, for a short time, only for 70 years, and then I will bring you back home. And in Ezra and Nehemiah, he is doing that. God wants them to know he still loves them. And that he has not given up on them. Now that's not Horatio Spafford's situation. He's not judging Horatio or his family. It's not your situation necessarily. But the lesson from it still applies to us. And in that scripture that Carl read to us this morning, did very well reading, by the way, didn't he? <laughs> From Jeremiah 29, is talking about that event in history. And here are God's words to his people in the southern kingdom. He says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 
plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. He said, I have plans for you. Not plans to harm you, but plans to prosper you, plans to bless you. That's God's perspective toward us. And even though it was very difficult when they went back to their homeland, back to Jerusalem in the region of Judah, and they had all kinds of opposition, obstacles, we see God's hand in it, even to the point that he bent the will of two world-dominating pagan kings. One who issued a decree for the people to go back home and rebuild the temple. The second one for the king, in the, 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 a later king, to decree and give, give funding even to go back and build the walls around the city, the task that Nehemiah is leading. And so God changed world history in order to fulfill his promise in Jeremiah 29. That is the kind of God that we trust, that we put our hands into, put, put into ourselves into his hands. That is the God that carries us through our troubles, that reminds us that he's not going to abandon us, and that even when the very worst happens to us, he is there. And so, every, through every victory, God is with us. Through every tragedy, God is with us. We're never alone. And how could we ever question his love when we look to Jesus, the object of his love, his, his one and only, his is the Greek's monogenes, unique, one-of-a-kind son, the only son of God. We are children of God, yes. Jesus is the only son of God. He has one son, and he said, you can kill my son to pay for your sins. How could we ever question his love for us if he's willing to pay a price like that? No other God, no God that humans have invented, dreamed up, ever would do something like that. Only the true God would. He is the God who loves us and is on our side. It's no wonder that this man who was a church man, who loved God and worshipped him according to the knowledge that he had, was an elder in his Presbyterian church. When he went through this tragedy, he was prepared and this song came from his heart. It is well with my soul. I hope no tragedy ever comes into your life. <laughs> but I know what life is like, and I know that there's always a possibility. Don't fear it. Don't worry about it. Don't imagine it. Live your life fully and put your future into his hands. And Lord, haste the day when the face shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul